Welcome to Mr. Brown's Basement, a channel devoted to sharing the craft of repairing, restoring, and modifying vintage electronic gear, and other random stuff. This is my Franklin Ace 100 computer system. It consists of the Franklin Ace computer, two Apple Disk 2 compatible 140 kilobyte floppy disk drives, and an 11 inch monochrome NEC JB1260MA monitor. In this video, I want to make sure that my Franklin Ace 100 works. From the CPU to the drives to the monitor. And if there are any issues, I'd like to take care of them. It probably hasn't been turned on in 15 or 20 years, so it's about time. A little background about the Franklin Ace 100 leads us to the Apple II computer and its nearly identical successor, the Apple II Plus. Back in the late 1970s and early 80s, the Apple II was both hugely popular and immensely expensive. As was the custom at the time, Apple published lots of technical info users could use to understand how their Apple II worked. Since the Apple II was constructed almost completely of inexpensive, off-the-shelf electronic components, someone could in principle build their own Apple II from scratch and do it for a lot less money. Thus, the Apple II clone market was born. After all, it's a lot easier copying something successful than creating it yourself. That's exactly what the Franklin Computer Corporation did in 1981 with its first computer, the Franklin Ace 100, which happens to be the one that I have. Franklin copied everything, including the internal software. This was a risky move, and Apple sued their pants off and won, and set a legal precedent for copyright and cloning. Franklin went on to produce other Apple-related products, and eventually other things like PDAs. The keyboard, compared to an Apple II Plus keyboard, is a little bit nicer. It's got a few extra keys, and it's got a numeric keypad, shift and shift lock. The reset key is not part of the keyboard. Let's open it up. The screws are on the side. Here is the power supply. This is not my right ink. You will completely blank the computer. I assume that's destroy. We have a strapped 16K card, my favorite kind. A super serial card, which is for a printer or modem in slot 1. A dial-up modem card in slot 2, which is to go online. Slot 3 has a, an 80 column card to increase the display to 80 columns. And slot 6 has a disk interface. Those are the ROMs, 6 2K ROMs for a whopping total of 12 kilobytes of memory. Copying the ROMs got Franklin in trouble. And the 8 expansion slots, pure Apple II. Someone, not me, maybe Franklin, I don't know, added this modification. It goes to the 80 column card. So this would be another output for the 80 column video. What concerns me is the power supply. Unlike Apple's, there's a fan in it. It was a very good idea. Two things could be wrong with it. The electrolytics could be failing, and it could also have a Rifa brand line capacitor. They have a reputation for exploding. Not something I like my computers to do. The power supply out, I'm going to open it up and see what it looks like inside. I'm curious who made it. Many of Apple's power supplies were made by Aztec. Who knows who made this one? Ten screws later, the power supply is open. And guess what? Made by Aztec. And typical of Devices of this time, it has Rifa capacitors. They're just film capacitors that are made by a company called Rifa that are prone to exploding. They're X-type safety capacitors and they're 0.1 microfarads. I probably have some and I should do something about the dust. I'm going to replace the capacitors that are at risk of exploding and then I'm going to test it under load. And if it works, then I'm not going to replace the electrolytics. 
but if it's not operating properly, then the electrolytics have to go. This kind of power supply, like the ones in the Apple II, are switching supplies with protection circuitry. So if there's no load, or there's a short, they will turn themselves off and they'll start ticking. So they must be tested under load. Normally if you work on a power supply which has been used recently, you have to make sure all the capacitors are discharged, because you can get a really bad burn from some of these. High voltage, and high current. But this hasn't been used in decades, so I'm not worried about it. Well, this is a typical reefer cap. There's a crack that runs along the length of it. There's a crack over there. Now what would happen is the pressure would build up and it would eventually burst with really foul smelling smoke. It's all back together and it's plugged in but the power is off. I'm going to try turning it on. It should go tick 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 indicating that there is no load. At this point I'm going to assume that everything inside is hot so I'm not going to touch anything. Here we go. Good, I get the tick, 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 and the fan goes. Excellent. The next test will be to put it under load and see what it does. I've determined that ground is black and plus five is red. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a five ohm resistor, five ohm, 10 watt resistor on the five volt line. That should stop it from ticking. And then we'll see what kind of voltages we get. So on the 5 volt line we get 3.85, which is a little bit low. Plus 12 is 12.48. Minus 5 is minus all over the place. And minus 12 is... there we go. About 10, minus 10 volts. Okay, I'm most concerned about plus 5. Without something much closer to plus 5, TTL will not operate. It must be within about 10% of 5 volts. So I'm going to just adjust the trimmer here. Okay, it becomes unstable. Okay, we've got 4.77 volts. Let us try the other voltages again. We've got plus 5. We know plus 5 is close. Ooh, there's no load though. 15 volts. I might have to put it under load. Let's look at that plus 5 again. Turn it down to 4.5. See what it's like. TTL will still operate at that voltage. 14 volts. No load. Okay, let's see if we can put it under load. That 12 volts under load. It might be more reasonable. A 1 amp load for the 5 volt line and a 1 amp load for the 12 volt line. That's 12 ohms at 12 volts. Let's see what we get. Twelve point two nine, very nice. Twelve point three. Let's look at the five volt. Four point five. It certainly will operate at that. So, a little bit of load makes all the difference in the world. I'd prefer it a little closer to five, but it will operate. I'm going to put the power supply back together and give it a go on the motherboard. Oh, aren't we naughty. Apple II. So it's got a clone of the Apple ROMs in it. Okay, perhaps that's why Apple sued. Well, let's start testing the cards. I pulled out all the cards so they could be tested individually.
If you want to kill an Apple II, or Franklin in this case, plug in a card with the power on. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to make sure the power is off, LED is off, the display is off, and now plug it in. So I'm going to plug in the modem card into slot 2. Putting in the card and turning on the computer hasn't hung the computer, that's a good sign. I can't thoroughly test every card. What I can do is see if I can read the ROM in the I.O. space. I issue this command, call minus 151, I get the asterisk, and then because it's in slot 2, C200L, and I can read ROM. It's not all random garbage. We don't know if the card works for sure, but we know that it can be recognized by the system, and in most cases, that means the card works. I've plugged in the Super Serial card into slot 1. Because it's slot 1, it would be C100L. And yes, that's recognized as well. With the 80 column card, I'm going to try something different. I'm going to enable it with PR number 3 because it's in slot 3. And then I'm going to try and switch to the other video output. It will appear that the display will freeze. It's just redirected the output to slot 3. PR number 3. Right, it seems to have gone off into space. I connected the monitor to the 80 column card output. Now we have an 80 column display. Much smaller letters. And I've reset out of the 80 column display. So the 80 column display seems to have hung. Well, the display is hung, but the computer hasn't. I'll switch back to 40 columns. I've reinstalled the 16K card. You cannot test it by reading the ROM on it because there is no ROM on it. And also, there is no ROM space for slot zero. The easiest way to test it is to boot ProDOS. ProDOS requires 64K, and if it hangs, then the 16K card is probably bad. I've put the disk controller into slot six, which is where the first disk controller usually lives. I'm going to turn on the computer. It looks like it's hung, but it hasn't. What it's doing is trying to boot off slot 6 drive 1, which isn't there because nothing's connected up to it. So let's see if we can read the firmware. I'm going to hit reset, and again, call minus 151, which is the monitor program, and C600 because it's in the sixth slot, L. And yeah, it can be read. So it looks like all the cards are good. The only problem I've found so far is that plug is not perfect. Maybe it's a little dirty or worn, but if it's not in all the way, it won't boot. And the RAM won't be happy unless it gets plus and minus 5 and plus 12. Well, that wraps it up for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider giving me a thumbs up and subscribing to Mr. Brown's Basement for more interesting and unusual videos.